Welcome everyone to the 28th annual Queen's University Archives Lecture. Um, two more to go and we'll be putting out a, a publication of, of the first 30 that we uh, that we presented over, over the years. I certainly wish to thank you all for attending this evening, um, especially the family of uh, our guest speaker, as well as members of the uh, Beth Israel Synagogue. Um, I'm very encouraged too always by the, by the turnout. It's always comforting to see and have the support of the community um, in, in regard to our various programs, especially those centering on outreach and to know that we are, I hope, making a difference in the common understanding of what archives and archivists are all about when it comes to acquiring, preserving and making available the documentary heritage of not only Queens but the surrounding community and beyond. I'm also very pleased to welcome you here tonight as we the Archives helped Beth Israel congregation wind down its centennial year, a year in which they celebrated the 100th anniversary of the erection in 1910 of their first synagogue in Kingston, constructed at 148 Queen Street, directly across from St. Paul's Anglican Church between Montreal and Bagot Streets. And I believe a plaque was, uh, was placed on that site several, two weeks ago, was it? Two weeks ago? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't be there. Unfortunately, I was under uh, physio's orders not to move my, uh, my knee at that time. It's also exciting to announce that during the lead up to their year of celebration, the congregation made Queen's University Archives the stewards of their legacy when they transferred their archival records to our care and custody. We hope over the next number of months to make these records available and as accessible as is possible for reference and consultation by the broader scholarly and research communities. Prior to introducing tonight's speaker, I did want to take a few moments to say some introductory words about the lecture itself. It commenced in 1983 and came about through the inspiration of the late Dr. Charles Pullen, who was not only a professor of English at Queen's, but was also a founding member of the Archives Advisory Committee and its chair from 1985 to 1980, uh, 1991. Sorry. As former University Archivist Anne McDermott, along with former Public Services Archivist George Henderson, who is with us again this evening, so eloquently stated in their preface to Through Scholarly Eyes, Queen's University Archives Lectures 1983 to 1991, the lectures were established to showcase the eclectic richness of the archival resources available at Queen's, to highlight the cross-fertilization that results when interdisciplinary studies take place, and to bring to the fore the intellectual challenges and excitement that are nurtured when outstanding scholars bring experience and insight to bear on diverse archival material. And I think that's definitely going to be the case this evening. It now gives me great pleasure indeed to introduce tonight's guest lecturer, an individual whom I suspect is familiar to most, if not all of you in this room, and who therefore needs few words of introduction, though I will take the liberty of providing some at this time. He obtained his BA in political science from the University of Toronto in 1957, his master's in history from McGill University in 1960, and his doctorate in history from the University of Toronto in 1971. If you notice a the theme here, he's all circling all around Queens, and, and I understand the only reason he wasn't at Queens at that time is there wasn't an off-ramp on the 401 to, uh, to, to Queens. However, I, I am, of course, being facetious. And while completing his various degrees, he did spend two years teaching at Loyola College in Montreal in the early 1960s, a further year at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon in the mid-60s, and arrived at Queen's in 1966, where he's been ever since. Now Professor Emeritus in the Department of History, he has over the years supervised numerous doctoral and master's theses, has, and has sat as an examiner on too many theses committees around the country to count. His awards are legion, and has authored books and articles focusing in large measure on business and Jewish history, covering a wide variety of topics in connection with the latter in particular, are many. His latest work, Canada's Jews, A People's Journey, published by the U of T Press in 2008, was received with critical acclaim and is now a staple in Jewish studies courses around the country. When he was not preparing for tonight's lecture and watching baseball, I understand, which is a, another pastime, um, he was uh, engaged in researching a history of the Canadian clothing industry, 1850 to 1980, and as well a biography of the well-known political activist and politician in the Canadian Jewish community, Joseph Baruch Salzberg, whose personal papers, actually Salzberg's personal papers, now reside at Queen's University Archives, um, in large measure due to the efforts that um, our guest speaker um, uh, put towards them. 
So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 28th Annual Queen's University Archives Lecturer, Dr. Gerald Tolchinsky, who will be providing some answers to that most fascinating and intriguing of questions. What is special about Canadian Jewish history? Jerry? up here, uh, two sources. Can you hear me? Good. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, introduction, and thank you all for coming out tonight to uh, listen to my answer to that question of what is special about Canadian Jewish history. But this is a very distinctive uh, honor that uh, has been bestowed on me, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, you and your committee for selecting me. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, <clears throat> there's a Yiddish expression on which um, I'll, I'll retail to you tonight and translate as I go along on the assumption that maybe not everybody speaks Yiddish, but it, it, um, it's, uh, it goes like this, for drei hat Gott ungegreit a besondere Ganeden. For three categories of people, God has set aside a special um, paradise, um, Garden of Eden. For Rabbonim, the rabbis, for neamonim, for holy people, un professorim. Nor state noch ad hayom, but until today, er state latik. It's empty. <laughs> so um, none of us have made it, it seems. What I'm asking the question here tonight uh, in uh, a uh, fairly serious way, <clears throat> but I'll try to lighten it up as, as I go along, if you'll let me. Um, what is special about Canadian Jewish history? What is distinctive uh, about it? How does it differ from the experiences of Jews in other countries, especially those that are in many ways similar to Canada? In what respects is uh, this history similar, and to what Jewish histories should it be compared? Um, this lecture is given, by the way, as, as Paul mentioned, in the context of celebrations commemorating Kingston's Jewish history, which in fact stretches back nearly 200 years. Um, and the first Beth Israel synagogue that was built 100 years ago. The synagogue's archives committee, I want to pay special tribute to, has done a superb job in collecting and professionally organizing their historical records which are now housed here at Queens. And it's a tribute to the close relationship that has developed between the community and this university in the recent years. Now at the end of the 20th century and now 10 years into the 21st century, the modern Jewish experience seems to have been as cataclysmic and revolutionary as it was in the first century of the common era which witnessed the destruction of the second Jewish commonwealth. During the last century, what we've seen is massive, immigration, massive migrations from Eastern Europe to North and South America, to South Africa and to other countries. We've seen European Jews almost completely destroyed in the maelstrom of the Holocaust, and we've seen the emergence of the State of Israel <clears throat> as the center of Jewish national regeneration and as the new homeland for Jews throughout the world. So it's clear that in the last century the Jewish world has experienced revolutionary change and that its meaning is not even yet fully understood. It's mainly because archives which formerly were closed are now open to researchers and archivists and archivists are collecting more materials that historians 
can address themselves to the history of East European Jewry before the Holocaust. And they, they have been recent years been recreating the social life of the communities that were swept away because of the work of the archivists. A profusion of brilliant new works, books and journal articles based on these newly available documents have appeared to enlighten readers of many aspects of Eastern European Jewish history that we didn't know very much about. The practice of religion, women's roles, economic transformations, Christian Jewish relationships, and political participation, to name only a few. And the same is true, the same is true of the history of the Jews in North America, where archives are now acquiring relevant material, materials relevant to previously unexplored topics. So I pay tribute to the archivists. Without them, we couldn't work. Historians are investigating the Jewish past with a passion and a degree of accomplishment probably unmatched if one judges by the output in modern history. They're asking questions and trying to answer them with scholarly rigor and sensitivity to the subtleties of the nuance and the complexities that must bear exploration and explanation. And it's in that context and in that spirit that I offer the following observations, tentative conclusions really, on the history of the Canadian Jewish community, which is now the fifth largest in the world, next to those of the United States, Israel, Russia, and France. I offer what follows uh, with all the shaky confidence of an investigator who knows that he can provide only a progress report of sorts with answers to questions that yield tentative conclusions that must, in all honesty, be reported as interim until the next body of evidence is thoroughly studied and digested in the historian's never-ending quest for an approximation to the truth. So I return to my questions with what seems to me, on the basis of evidence I know, some answers in which I have some confidence but not absolute certainty. What I am pretty sure of is that Canadian Jewish history is a subject in its own right. It's not a branch or a pale reflection of the Jewish experience in the United States, nor is Canada one generation, as is sometimes said, behind the Americans. The shape of Canadian Jewish history were shaped, the, the shape what, <clears throat> excuse me, the contours were shaped by Canadian conditions and did not necessarily reflect occurrences and trends that took place first among the mainstream Americans and then years later, years later by their northern cousins, we Canadians. The Americanization of, of the Jews, their gradual or rapid adaptation to and acceptance into the mainstream of United States culture and the development of what might be called the American Jewish symbiosis, that is the coming together of some uh, elements of Judaism and Americanism, the symbiosis, the synthesis that is brilliantly set out in the works of some historians like Jonathan Sarna was not necessarily mirrored in Canada. So the Canadian Jew who becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court or Governor of the Bank of Canada or a member of the federal cabinet or a highly decorated officer in the Canadian forces or a leading literary figure is not simply the northern equivalent of American Jews like Justice Brandeis, Henry Morgenthau, Bernard Baruch, Admiral Rickover, Philip Roth. Now, of course, there are many significant, almost overpowering resemblances between the, Canadian and Amer the American and Canadian Jewish historical experiences. And in certain respects, the communities are so similar as to be almost indistinguishable. Without doubt, the more numerous and more highly developed American Jewish communities exercise strong and continuing influences on Canada. After all, in both cases, most of their people came from Eastern Europe, 
speaking about the Jews, in sudden and vast immigration waves before 1914. And of course, much of the cultural baggage that they brought with them was identical in both countries, including, as we all know, deeply religious orthodoxy in many and a complex mix of philosophies such as Marxism, socialism, anarchism, Zionism, Buddhism, and various other isms and ideals among many of the young who had been exposed to the intellectual ferment and transformations going on outside their own narrow world in Eastern Europe. The historical development of both Canada, the, both the American and Canadian Jewish communities was also highly similar, particularly in things like the post-1900 settlement patterns and various other matters. But what should not be conceded is that all of the major forces that shaped the Jewish experience in Canada were the same as or even similar to those in the United States. What I'm trying to say here in a roundabout way, I guess, is Canadian Jewry experienced a significantly different evolution as a result of the national context in which it was situated. It's not enough to say that Canada was a different country. After all, Canada's proximity to the American giant and the similarity of peoples and outlooks inevitably resulted in very strong American influences, as I've said, including the effects on the Jewish community. However, it's important to understand that at the same time, there were different coordinates up here, north of the 49th parallel. In the Canadian constitutional structure, in the evolution of Canadian political life, in national or ethnic or racial composition, in urban patterns and economic development, all of which directly affected the evolution of Jewish life in Canada. Some of the most significant factors influencing the Jewish community in this country had no counterparts in the United States, as I'll try to explain. So consequently, if we say now, here in 2010, have certain, in certain respects become indistinguishable from one another, they reached this commonality by different routes. Let me get to the first major point. The duality of Canada's national personality, that is to say the French-English divide, posed particularly acute problems for the very large segment of the Canadian Jewish community until recently it was nearly half and even now it is about one third living in the province of Quebec. There in Quebec at Confederation in 1867 because of a whole complex of disputes and disputations uh, before Confederation I don't have time to get into a school system was established that put the Jewish community, as it evolved, at a very serious disadvantage. Because in the Confederation arrangements, there was, uh, and in the, the laws that, that emanated from it in the province of Quebec, there was no legal provision for Jewish children in either the Catholic or the Protestant system of schooling, which was, in the province of Quebec, confessional. If you were Protestant, your children went to Protestant schools, whether you liked it or not. And if you were Catholic, they went to Catholic, similar. But there was no provision for Jewish or other non-Catholic, non-Protestant um, uh, non children. So whether Jewish children had a right, a legal right, to go to school was a very testy legal and political question that was, that was resolved only in stages over nearly 30 years of very bitter struggle between 1903 and 1930, including serious disputes within the Jewish community about establishing a separate Jewish school system. It might come as a surprise to some of you that not all Jews agree with each other. Uh, as uh, <coughs> um, um, as is true among Christians. Um, uh, uh, this issue was not finally settled in, fine, it was not finally settled until 1994. 
And so it was a furious, bitter, and protracted battle for fundamental civil rights that were being denied to the Jewish community by the Protestant school commissioners of Montreal and by the Quebec provincial government. There were some issues in the courts, of course, and in an interesting, uh, um, momentous decision by um, uh, Mr. Justice Davidson in the Quebec Superior Court, it was decided that Jews were really Protestants <clears throat> for purposes of education uh, and that they would go, um, whether they liked it or not, to the Protestant schools. Well, uh, needless to say, this uh, was um, 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 an issue of some contest, and I, I unfortunately can't get into details, but I have dealt with uh, this complex issue uh, in some of the books I've written, so uh, <clears throat> uh, just so I can pump up the royalties, uh, I would uh, just mention that. But the minor victories in the courts and in the legislative assembly were the result, what I'm trying to say is a result of the galvanization of the Jewish community on a massive scale, which led to the emergence of a collective combative consciousness, which was noteworthy for its major spokesman, its newspaper development, intense intracommunal debate and dispute, should we establish a separate Jewish school system? Should we not? Will the province allow it? What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, uh, tests uh, should be uh, administered? Who should run the school system? All of that um, was uh, at issue during the 1920s in Montreal. It great, greatly heightened the awareness of the Jewish place in the legal, political, and social context of La Belle Province. But what I'm saying here in addition to all of this, is that nothing like this kind of Jewish civil rights fight occurred in the United States. Because nowhere in the Great Republic did the same kind of coordinates exist to bar the Jewish advance to social equality. Now, <clears throat> this crucial context with its ramifications throughout all sectors of the community that, I repeat, included half of the Jews in, this, in the Dominion of Canada, was only one feature of Canadian Jewish history that grew out of Canada's duality, distinctive duality. In fact, Quebec's rapidly expanding Jewish community ran directly afoul during these very same years of French-Canadian nationalism. And during its efflorescence in the late 19th, early 20th century, this conflict was a tough one. In this era, such nationalism embodied a blend of what Mich historian Michel Brunet calls agriculturalism, anti-statism, and messianism, where Denis Monnier asserts that the church regarded quote, the opposition forces as the fiends of hell, unquote. And this combined a militant, ultramontane Catholic faith, an ultramontane renewed adherence to Rome and the Pope, with the national rebirth of an agricultural, French-speaking republic on the St. Lawrence. And amongst those, French intellectuals, clerics, university professors, and others, including the future Prime Minister of Canada. And you can guess, I think. Amongst those who believed in this visionary frame of reference, the Jew was a standing affront, a force fostering morals that th threatened French Canada's survival. Amongst other things, the Jew was the infidel, the Christ killer whose continuing rejection of Christianity constituted an insult to the faith, and whose rapidly increasing presence in Montreal was seen as dire threat to the purity of the French-Canadian ideal. The Jew was viewed by certain segments of French-Canadian society as the arch-traitor, the perfidious betrayer of France's honor, which was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt in the conviction of Captain Alfred Dreyfus in Paris in 1894 for treason. 
The Jew came to be regarded as an economic threat as well, both as the unscrupulous exploiter in the clothing industry in which Jewish contractors worked the piecing out system using Jewish and French Canadian sweated labor in home or attic shops where 80 hour weeks were not uncommon and as a competitor in the market for unskilled and semi-skilled jobs. And this led to some very nasty and embarrassing disputes within the Jewish community. As many Jewish employers moved their factories in what were called runaway shops from Montreal out into the eastern townships and other rural areas to employ cheaper French Canadian labor. The Jew was also perceived as the political and social radical and trade union activist, the purveyor of insidious socialist and anarchist ideas that some French Canadian clerical and lay leaders saw as infectious and corrosive poisons in the pure springs of their people's religious and social life. In all then, the Jew was included amongst those who constituted a threat to the destiny of the Quebecois to survive and thrive as a, as a distinctive Catholic and French agrarian polity in Quebec. Now, the, the fact that the Jews attracted such animosity, which welled up repeatedly in newspapers, pamphlets, church sermons, should not surprise us. Jews were the largest minority in the province of Quebec, outside the old stock English-speaking groups, uh, in which I include the Irish for the moment. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure they'd accept that, but anyway. Uh, um, <clears throat> maybe you'll challenge me on it, who, though separated by class and religious issues, never, nevertheless maintained a certain transcendent coherence and unity and were headed by a tight, tough, and wealthy um, elite. I'm talking about the old stock English-speaking groups. Montreal's Jewish quarter, in fact, along St. Lawrence, Maine, you probably know, acted as a, a, a physical, you might say as a physical barrier uh, between uh, French and English sections of Montreal. And um, it symbolized, you might say, the precarious marginality of the Jewish presence to both communities. Insofar as Quebec Anglophones were concerned, the Jews were not welcome, as indicated by the treatment of Jewish pu pupils and treatments in the Protestant school board, and I should, I should mention um, uh, just parenthetically that uh, as a result of the 1903 decision, Jews were Protestants for purposes of education. But because they were in a Protestant religious school system, Jewish teachers could not be hired. So it was kind of a catch-22. You, you paid taxes, but you could not be represented on the school board and you couldn't teach in the Protestant school system because it was Protestant. So um, anyway... Um, uh, the, the anomaly did not escape contemporaries uh, who argued uh, uh, against it, but without very much success. Um, <clears throat> there were serious restrictions in employment in Anglophone banks, insurance companies, shipping, railways. Francophones, because of their closer proximity, were able to manifest their anti-Semitism both on the street and in the political arena. But the anti-Semitism of Montreal's Anglo-Protestants who made Jews unwelcome in their schools and re severely restricted entry into white collar jobs and McGill University was much more damaging to the Jews. French and Anglo anti-Semitism taken together was very serious business in the province of Quebec. And if you were a Jew living there, you had a tough time. And it had a long lasting effects on the political and social well-being of the large Jewish and growing Jewish population. These incidents, I should mention, were highlighted by one uh, dramatic event, an exceptionally dramatic event, in 1910, when a Quebec City lawyer by the name of Plamondon published accusations that Jews were practicing abominations stemming from the Talmud, such as the blood libel. And this underscored the fact that anti-Semitism in Quebec seemed to possess a special force, a greater depth and virulence than anywhere else in North America. 
After 1920, this anti-Semitism welled up time and again, not only to remind Jews of their inferior position in the eyes of French Canadian nationalist and ultramontane clerics, but also to reduce their presence in sectors where they had achieved some prominence. Now, uh, <clears throat> anti-Semitism was not unique to French Canada. Uh, the same could be said of the rest of English Canada, where such sentiments were uh, also received widespread expression, most notably from the pen of Toronto's leading late 19th century intellectual and professor, Goldwyn Smith, um, who, um, through uh, the prestige of his position and uh, his connections in the Toronto community, uh, spread anti-Semitism of the most virulent kind throughout the English-speaking world. He had formerly been a professor at Oxford, had moved to and helped to found uh, Cornell University, uh, and then uh, saw the error of his ways and married a rich Toronto widow, uh, which set him up uh, for the rest of his life, and also provided substantial funding for his anti-Semitic publications. So, um, the Canadian Jewish community in this sense uh, was affected by these conditions which uh, led to a militancy, to a response, to, a, um, a counter, to, the, to an attempt to organize a countervailing force. And the creation of national organizations which were much more effective in Canada than national organizations were in the United States. This is attributable to the fact that Canadians felt more threatened. One of the leading reasons for the reactivation of the Canadian Jewish Congress after 1933 was the need to counter the increasingly virulent anti-Semitism in Quebec. And Congress worked out um, its program in conjunction with Bene Brith uh, in creating, after 1939, a joint public relations committee with a mandate to combat domestic anti-Semitism. I want to get, I'll get back to this organizational issue in a moment, but I want to emphasize that this governance through national organizations was facilitated by another peculiar feature of Canadian Jewry. And that is its overwhelming concentration in a few metropolitan centers. In contrast to the Jews in the United States, where by the 1840s, significant Jewish communities existed in all the major cities up and down the eastern seaboard and in the Midwest and in the Gulf Coast, Canada's Jews were overwhelmingly concentrated in Montreal and Toronto. Later, Winnipeg became a third center, and much later, um, Vancouver. As uh, Quebec City withered and Victoria stagnated, and the maritime centers had barely begun. In the United States, by contrast, as I say, even before the Civil War, there were about 200 congregations in existence across the country, some of them in major southern cities. And in the 1870s, Cincinnati, Ohio, emerged as a leading center of Jewish religious life, and Philadelphia as a major educational and cultural hub, while Chicago attracted a huge Jewish population after the 1880s, and much later, of course, in the 20th century, in the 19th, from the 1920s on, Los Angeles emerged as a major center. All of these communities, I want to emphasize, were organizationally independent of New York, a city one quarter Jewish by 1914 and the residents of about half of all of America's Jews. In Canada, there were no counterparts to these diffused Jewish centers, which diffused power and influence in American Jewry that national organizations, as a result, have always been relatively weak and they still are. The American Jewish Congress has just recently been disbanded. With a high concentration of Canadian Jews in two or three cities, 
and about half of them in Montreal. Countervailing influences did not develop here north of the 49th parallel on anything like the scale that they did in the United States. And so, conversely, Jewish national organizations were able to establish themselves here much more effectively than their American counterparts. After 1898, for example, the Federation of Zionist Societies emerged as a kind of foreshadowing of, of the Congress, and it became a kind of national um, Jewish organization, which uh, was mirrored later by um, others that were all centered in Montreal, Hadassah, B'nai B'rith, and various youth organizations. Now there's one other point that I want to get onto here, and it I think helps to further underscore the differences between Canada and the United States, the Canadian and American Jewish experiences. American Jewry, and at least until 1900, was dominated by German immigrants who arrived during the middle years. I'm not anti-German. I'm just trying to describe it here. So don't, anybody who is of German background, please don't take offense. But I'm just trying, don't shoot the messenger is what I'm trying to say. Um, some of my best friends, you know. Uh, uh, but the German immigrants who arrived during the middle years of the 19th century brought with them important cultural baggage, which included fragments of the Enlightenment philosophy of Moses Mendelssohn and some of the influences of the new scientific study of Jewish culture, this Vision, Wissenschaft des Judentums. And from this early 19th century Jewish reform movement, a new synagogue emerged a, with a theology and a liturgy in which virtually all elements of Jewish particularism were expunged and Jewish universalism was celebrated. Thus many, not all, German Jews were transformed into, you might say, Germans of the Mosaic persuasion. Jewish rel religious <clears throat> beliefs were reinterpreted and reformulated root and branch by the rabbis of the New Judaism. And this New Judaism, this Reform Judaism, was transposed to America. And in this transposition, the Germans erected Reform synagogues. They established Cincinnati, which was in its day a very German city, um, as their center, and virtually dominated American Jewish religious life. So that by 1880, one authority claims most of the synagogues in the United States were temples. And they were, excuse me, were reformed temples. And now, in the transposition to the United States, to America, they now became Americans of the Mosaic persuasion. No longer Germans of the Mosaic persuasion, but Americans of the Mosaic persuasion. Acquiring wealth, influence, and power, and social prestige, these were the people uh, of our crowd, the Loeb's, the Kuhn's, the Gimbel's, the Guggenheim's, and others. They began a process of merging into the American mainstream, while still others, like Louis D. Brandeis, made significant contributions to American progressivism. Here in Canada, north of the 49th, the Jewish community developed in a much different way because, in part, Canada did not receive significant numbers of German Jewish immigrants. With, ref with the reform impulses to overwhelm the existing institutions. So Canada, you might say, escaped being heavily influenced by the reform movement and its philosophy of emancipation. Kingston, in fact, provides a very interesting example and here I employ the excellent research of Rachel Levy and Howard Edelman, and the newly organized synagogue archives have helped a lot here. Some German Jews arrived, 
but for the most part, they moved away. And the very few that stayed on, like the Oberndorfer family, were absorbed by the Litvaks, who, became, who began arriving here uh, later. And uh, anybody who knows Jewish life knows that uh, there is, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's no contest uh, between uh, uh, German Jews and Litvaks. Um, uh, <clears throat> the Litvaks will win every time. <laughs> Canadian Jews, small in number and concentrated in few centers, mostly were not exposed to the German Jewish reform synthesis as it was worked out in the United States or to the Enlightenment influenced orthodoxy that, that uh, arose in Germany to counter it. Indeed, the most influential elements culturally in the Montreal Jewish community until the 1880s were the Spanish and Portuguese, so-called. They weren't really Spanish, but they had. They adopted uh, that uh, uh, association partly because um, of uh, the prestige that went along with it. These were the real Jews. Um, <clears throat> well, in Toronto, the British and the Lithuanians, the Litvaks, outnumbered all other elements. So these dominant groups, I'm trying to say, in Montreal and Toronto were essentially conservative and orthodox in religious practice. Stephen Spiesman, historian of Toronto Jewry, points out that until the early 20th century, the division between the traditional and liberal wings of the Holy Blossom congregation were minor. There were no major departures from orthodoxy while the congregation remained in existence during the 19th century. And while certain reform influences began to affect the main group in, the, in Toronto in the 1880s, the Montrealers remained adamantly, almost pugnaciously orthodox. Rabbi Abraham de Sola, one of the Spanish and Portuguese, and his son Meldola de Sola, who held the pulpit of the congregation in succession for about 70 years, acted as stout defenders of the Orthodox tradition and successfully kept the tiny reform group out of the mainstream of religious life in the community. My point is that the absence of a significant German migration to Canada, large enough to overwhelm or replace the traditional communities, is highly significant. For while American Jewry was greatly influenced by reform philosophy, Canada was affected to a lesser degree. And as I say, in Montreal, certain counter-reformation spirit prevailed. Most of Canadian Jewry were religiously inclined, who were religiously inclined, remained predominantly tied to the old faith, even though some assimilation was underway. And even those who were not religiously inclined the socialists, the communists, and so on, who stemmed from Eastern Europe. Would not go to synagogue, but the, one, the synagogue that they would not go to was the Orthodox synagogue. <laughs> you know. Uh, I... This outlook in Canada, this conservative ethos, 19th century, where traditional values prevailed of crown, nearly established churches, and certain quasi-aristocratic trappings related to the British connection. I mean, we just saw the installation of a new governor general. Did you see the pomp and circumstance uh, that, that goes along with that? Well, that's, that's imported from the British connection. Canadian Jews, like the influential de Solas, saw themselves as defenders of British traditions. And they said so frequently, as well as Jewish orthodoxy. And although this uh, outlook never had the philosophical respectability of the ideal German or American Jewish symbiosis, it did establish a certain British tone or shading for the community. During the Boer War, the end of the <laughs> the war in South, the South African War, the Boer War, uh, from 1899 to 90, 1902, some of the rabbis uh, made uh, very strong uh, appeals for um, recruitment to uh, the, British, the British Army, 
to, um, uh, for Canadian Jews, uh, Canadians, Canadian Jews to join the British Army uh, to fight in, uh, in defense of British interests in South Africa. Um, and some actually, a few of them did actually join and went. One of them got the uh, Victoria Cross. Um, in Canada, especially in Quebec, Jews knew that they were different and would, would remain so. Now, with orthodoxy, even if it was only nominal and tradition firmly in place and centered in a very much smaller, more concentrated group of communities, by the 1880s and 90s, Canadian Jewry faced a wave of immigrants who continued to arrive until the First World War. During the 1920s, after the war was over, many of these differences began between the two communities began to diminish, but not entirely. In both Canada and the United States, the East European Jews, whether traditional or radical, came increasingly into communal prominence. And they thronged, as we know, into the clothing factories and um, into um, uh, uh, various uh, socialist movements. But what is what I want to emphasize in this connection is that Zionism has been a continuous and dominant part of the Canadian Jewish identity. Now, it's not to say that the majority of Can Canadian Jews have been openly Zionist, but significant segments of the old patrician and nouveau riche elites were. American Jews, or at least the leadership and the moneyed elite, on the other hand, for many years, held back from Zionism or actively opposed it. The same was true in Britain, by the way. For many American Jews, especially those who had the ideal of the symbiosis, you know, Americans of the Mosaic persuasion. The goal implanted by the mid-19th century German immigrants, Zionism was a threat because it raised the problem of dual loyalty. The nagging question of how one could be a Zionist, that is one who believed in the return of Jews to the ancient homeland, while still being a loyal American, dedicated to the achievement of the cultural integration into the United States, could not be easily answered. And when the famous um, uh, Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Louis D. Brandeis, developed a partially satisfying answer to this dilemma. Most of the old German community from which he came, by the way, now Americans, America's Jewish elite, continued a steadily militant anti-Zionist stance. And it is interesting to note that the... Uh, uh, Reform synagogue was a major vehicle for opposition to Zionism. There might have been a few uh, reform leaders who espoused it, but at the Cincinnati Seminary, which trained the reform rabbis, rabbinical students were taught by outspoken opponents of Zionism. And consequently, this message was heard, you know, a few years later from many American reform pulpits didn't wash in Canada. Because when one American rabbi, hired by Holy Blossom, Rabbi Maurice Eisendrat, tried to import this anti-Zionism and infuse it into his Toronto Reform Congregation, Holy Blossom, you know, the one, the, the, the synagogue in Toronto that looks like a cathedral uh, on Bathurst Street. In, in the late night, when he tried to do this in the late 1920s, the community was outraged, outraged, and a sizable secession from the synagogue took place. Although the unrepentant rabbi continued his attack, but he ceased his, op he ceased his opposition to Zionism in the late 1930s, as did most of Reform Jewry for one principal terrible reason. And this leads me to another point. The explanation of the more favorable attitudes towards Zionism amongst Canadians meant that, in part, Jews in Canada did not understand that 
like most of the rest of the population, that there were any tests of Canadian nationalism that they had to meet. In Montreal, they were nearly pariahs, barely tolerated by both French and English, but the predominant strain of pre-1914, pre-1920, Canadian nationalist thought was that of what were called the Imperial Federationists. And the Imperial Federationists believed in a, in a kind of um, a Canadian association, a kind of blood relationship uh, with the rest of the white empire um, that overrode all other associations. It expressed a narrowly British view of history, national character, and Canada's mission, but it also indirectly implied an integration into British imperialism, a theoretical and rhetorical toleration, an openness, a liberality towards racial and cultural diversity, and a grudging acceptance for whites in this polity in which freedom was said to wear a crown. From the standpoint of uh, Canadian intellectuals, uh, Jews like Ukrainians and Chinese were communities that could be absorbed. And it may be that the origins of the Canadian mosaic lie somewhere in these attitudes. And in fact, there appears to have been no public opposition, uh, no, no public ethos in English Canada that necessarily arose, overrode all other loyalties. This was in stark contrast to the United States, where there was a pronounced statement pervade in the schools, through the universities, and through the public media, from the American Revolution on, certainly from the, from the time of the American Civil War forward, that America was different, that America established certain requirements of association and affiliation um, to the American ideal. There is no counterpart to this in Canada. So the Zionist movement thrived, and it grew. And in Canada, it was a far stronger movement than it was in the United States. Even it spread across the country, even into small communities uh, like Kingston, where uh, community builder Isaac Cohen was especially active. Modern political Zionism came as one major vehicle of redemption for Eastern European Jews uh, from a hateful and oppressive Tsarist regime. And consequently, when these Jews arrived in Canada, they had no predisposition towards symbiosis, as I've explained, and Zionism in various forms and programs thrived because Canadian Jewish leaders like the DeSola family and various other members of the Montreal and Toronto elite saw the movement as potentially integral, an integral part of British imperialism. So Canadian Zionism in Canada went deeper into the Canadian Jewish context than into the American one because of this conjuncture of separate and distinctive cultural demographic, and political factors, and because of the unique constitutional and racial structure of Canada. And it's even possible, in fact, that um, uh, in reaction to French-Canadian anti-Semitism and nationalism, Canadian Jewish community may have, it's kind of the other side of the coin, have absorbed some nationalistic influences from the French Canadians in Montreal. It's not pure coincidence that when the Canadian Jewish Congress was established in, 18, in, in, excuse me, in 1919, it met in the citadel of French Canadian nationalist uh, uh, organization and uh, 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 affiliation uh, in the famous Monument National, which still stands on St. Lawrence, bottom of St. Lawrence Street in uh, Montreal. A further determining factor in Canadian Jewish history is that Canada continued to receive substantial Jewish immigration. 
through the 1920s. While the tide to the US, though numerically larger, was relatively far less significant. The typical immigrants of 1923-24, when a major influx of 5,000 Jews, including my father, arrived from Romania, were probably different from their counterparts of 1914. And this is my final major point. These Jews, which were relatively more numerous, taking population ratios in Canada than they were in the United States, had experienced firsthand the European turmoil of 1914-18. They had experienced the massive upheaval of the Russian Revolution and the ensuing, the ensuing devastating civil war and the terrible Ukrainian pogroms. Recent Eastern European history and modernization of Russia before 1914, as well as the resonances of the old world, therefore had a deeper, more pervasive, and lasting effect on the Canadian Jewish community because of its relative size than on the American one. And this immigration included a small number of, of intellectuals who deeply enriched Jewish cultural life, especially in Montreal. So let me conclude. The contours of the Canadian Jewish, of Canadian Jewish history were determined by a unique set of coordinates uh, <clears throat> that resulted in the evolution of a community with a personality different from that of American Jewry. Canada had a different history, a polity, a cultural and racial mix, uh, <clears throat> national composition, different immigration, economic and urban growth patterns. And not surprisingly, as I've tried to explain, the community here was more traditional, more superficially unified, and more culturally homogeneous than the US. While American Jewry yearned for integration into the mainstream of the great republic, Canadians strove to express their Jewishness in a country that had no coherent self-definition, except perhaps the solitudes of duality, isolation, northernness, and borrowed glory. In the United States, Irving Berlin wrote, God bless America. In Canada, the quintessential Jewish literary figure who is widely recognized as this country's greatest 20th century poet and greatest Jewish poet of his generation in North America, Abraham Moses Klein, wrote poems of anguish, expressing longing for redemption of the Jewish soul lost in a sea of modernity. Go catch the echoes of the ticks of time. Spy the interstices between its sands, he tells us in his poem of remembrance. And while he was able in his superb collection of poems, The Rocking Chair, to capture the culture of French Canada better than any Anglophone has done in recent times. He reiterated throughout his career his Jewish frame of reference, including a powerful response to the early signs of the Holocaust in his collection, The Hitleriad of 1941. Towards the end, his thoughts returned to, quote, the ghetto streets where a Jew boy dream pavement into bi pleasant Bible land. It is a fabled city that I seek. It stands <clears throat> in space's vapors and time's haze. Thence comes my, my sadness in remembered joy, constrictive of the throat. Thence do I hear, as heard by a Jew boy, the Hebrew violins delighting in the sobbed oriental note. We have seen some of the features that can make Canadian Jewish history a separate study, and to be, to be sure, they're not entirely distinct from the American Jewish experience. Many similarities exist, and as Canadian history is in certain respects both different from and similar to American history, the historical experience of at least one group, the Jews, in this country is a reflection of that reality. Maybe one can generalize from this 
and maybe in looking at the experiences of other uh, ethnic communities in Canada, the same kinds of distinctiveness can be highlighted. In conclusion, let me emphasize that the similarities are strong, but they must not be allowed to obscure the differences. And there are some that I have not discussed. The Red Scare of the 1950s, when the Canadian reaction, though present, was not as devastating as it was in the United States. The Black Civil Rights Crusade of the 1960s, which had no counterpart in Canada. And of course, the Vietnam War, in which Canada was not directly involved. All of these affected the US Jewish community in greater or lesser ways without any significant reverberations north of the 49th parallel in what Canadians have come to think of as the peaceable kingdom. Up here, we have other issues that impinge on us Jews. The possible, some would say probable, separation of Quebec from Canada and the potential breakup of the country. The transformation of the Jewish community through immigration and the rise of new forms, some of them life-threatening of anti-Semitism. On these and other, stop, and other topics, the scholars I mentioned earlier are hard at work. So I hope that you will stay tuned for further announcements of important historical discoveries, which a new generation of historians, with the aid of the archivists, God bless them, until the next will we'll pursue, until the next generation comes along and overturns everything or much of what they've done, and so on and so on. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, Jerry has very kindly and generously um, will give some of his time to, to questions. I'm sure you must have some. Very generous. <laughs> so please. Any questions, arguments, challenges? <clears throat> Mel? Yeah, start on a lighter note. Uh, your own exceptional career as a uh, hockey player, notwithstanding, uh, there doesn't seem to be a an equivalent between uh, the American experience of uh, uh, Jewish Americans being very prominent in the international game of baseball. Uh, have there been many Jewish hockey players? Uh, well, actually, uh, hockey players, yes. Uh, there, was, there was one that I know. <laughs> I know of one. Uh, um, but remember, you know, a very much smaller community, so. Um, uh, this was um, a, a big burly of a guy, uh, Alec Levinsky, who grew up in the Toronto uh, community and played for the Toronto Maple Leafs in the 1930s. Uh, he was a defenseman, and he could mix it up with the toughest, uh, uh, toughest guys in the corners. Um, and his, uh, his career lasted, I don't know, eight or nine years, I'm not sure how long. Um, there have been other uh, Jewish hockey players who have come along, and uh, there's, I understand, uh, uh, um, from this community, uh, one budding uh, hockey player who, uh, who knows, one might make it to the NHL. I won't mention names, but anyway, um, it's, uh, it's distinctly, it's, 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 it's not a game um, uh, that is tract, has attracted large numbers of Jewish participants, but um, um, there have been there has been at least one. And, <laughs> uh, oh, there was a goalie. I'm sorry. There was another one I can think of. Mike Weiser. He was a, he was a goalie for Chicago Blackhawks. Um, uh, sometime in the '60s. I don't know how long he lasted. Thank you. Could be a bit still. No, no, that no, get away with that. I have two, two professional hockey players in my family. Two. Yes. Oh, my, okay. my mother's twin brother. They grew up in Timmins, they went, he went to play professional hockey in Philadelphia. I read his stats a couple of years ago. He's a defenseman, uh, no goals, no assists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then okay. I have a cousin who was at one time the sub goal of Chicago Blackhawks in the 1930s. 1930. Yeah, but they all, they, they all, their professional careers were in the United States, not in Canada. It's...
very interesting. I mean, there were only two Canadian teams in the NHL in, in the old days. In, in the old days. I, I, don't, I don't mean now. So, you know, there was Toronto and Montreal. Um, I don't think, quite frankly, given the, the state uh, of uh, play uh, that a, a Jewish player could have, could have gone on the ice in Montreal, except maybe as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, to play for the Canadiens, I, I somehow doubt it. I, I don't think he'd have lasted five minutes. Uh, uh, Gord? I just wanted to add, as a Chicago Blackhawks fan, uh, the current goaltender of the Chicago Blackhawks is, is from the Sudbury Jewish community. I saw Sue Sainte Marie, Jewish community, Marty Charco. Okay. Yeah, I'm All right, so. Yep. Stu? Uh, in, in all fairness to the Jewish athletes, the YMHA in Montreal was the home. Probably some of the best basketball teams and amateur boxers in Canada. And wrestlers. Wrestlers too, wrestling with gods, wrestling with each other. But I think probably programs were just not open to Jews in the same way as they were. No, there were some famous Jewish Canadian boxers. Sammy Lefspring was a middleweight, and he was a real contender. He actually went to the he went to the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Um, and uh, uh, this was against the wishes of the Canadian Jewish Congress. Um, and there's a whole story there, uh, which my colleague uh, in Toronto, uh, Hesh Troper, has investigated. So you come to the archives lecture, you expect you <laughs> one lecture, and you get a second lecture on something entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> there's, that, there's a hand. Uh, yes. Lady yes. There, and then mm -hmm. um, down the end, and then back to, to you, Matt. Yes. I just want to mention. Uh, Yes, Sammy Love and Baby Yak was another one, uh, and uh, there were a couple of others. That they used to fight in clubs, uh, which was strictly illegal, um, and um, uh, then then they went they went professional, uh, and I think they both went to the 1936 Olympics and fought they fought for Canada. Um, uh, the, but there's a whole story to it. Yes, I was. Well, I never got to meet Mordecai until he came to Queens a few years before he died. Um, I had sent him a copy of one of my books, and he never responded. Uh, <laughs> and I, but <clears throat> for he didn't respond for a long time, and then and then he sent me a very gracious letter, saying that he'd been tied up with various things, and uh, that he he'd read the book and yada yada. Um, and uh, then I met him when he came here. He was, he was very gracious and kind, very kind of a sweet guy. Uh, did he have any influence on me uh, to doing this? Well, you know, like everybody else, I read uh, The Apprenticeship of Dodie Kravitz. Uh, but no, it wasn't that so much that influenced me because I'm, I'm actually a contemporary of his so that, so that uh, well, a few years younger maybe, but... Uh, I just came to appreciate the distinctiveness of the Montreal situation uh, while I was a member of a Canadian Zionist youth organization, Young Judea, uh, and went to many gatherings and conferences there and met the, the, the Montrealers. And they were a special, special breed, most of them. Um, and very interesting. And that, that kind of got me interested in, in that. were different in the U.S. and Canada, but assimilation and sort of walking away from religion. And if, you, and if they were different, if you think that has something to do with the different uh, sort of contextual factors that you talked about. I'm not sure what you mean by assimilation. By assimilation, I mean um, uh, giving up of the religion. Okay. Uh, yeah, that... It's so hard to track in the United States because the United States census, excellent as it is, far superior to the new breed that we're going to have imposed on us here, does not, uh, the one category that the, the United States census does not list is religion. Um, 
uh, which I, I take, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert on this, is uh, basically um, part of the American tradition of separating church and state. Uh, so, it's, so what I'm trying to say uh, clumsily here is that it's hard to track, um, uh, say, people born of Jewish parents or of one Jewish parent or Jewish grandparents who have another religion. It's possible, it was possible up until now uh, to track that in Canada. And so, um, yeah, that, uh, that has been tracked. The, the, the great um, uh, uh, historical uh, demographer, Louis Rosenberg, who worked for the Congress, uh, Canadian Jewish Congress for many years, and he published a marvelous book um, t uh, with all sorts of statistics derived from the census of Canada um, from its excellent years, and he, that's one thing he did track, so you can, you can get that. But is there a difference? Um, um, I, I'm not sure, but the, the folklore has it that, the, that the, the rate of assimilation here, in rate of intermarriage, rate of, uh, you know, all of these, these, these traceable um, um, uh, life threshold uh, issues uh, uh, show that the rate of assimilation in Canada is less, but not that much less than it is in the United States. Have I answered your, your question? Uh, I was interested in your comments about how the relatively vicious anti-Semitism in Quebec inhibited the intellectual development of the Jews by preventing their getting into universities and so on. Um, in the 1950s, when I was growing up, everyone knew there were quotas in oh, yeah. Yale. My question is, how prevalent was this in the rest of the country, and was it substantially less than it was in uh, Montreal? Um, <clears throat> the University of Manitoba in the 1930s uh, had um, uh, a distinct quota on Jews and, and, and other ethnics, that is to say, other non-British uh, people of non-British stock from entering the School of Medicine. Uh, 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 there was the Canadian Jewish Congress got into that, um, uh, the local branch and, and the National Congress got into it, and the local community got um, um, into it and made uh, such a serious issue out of it that, that the whole pattern of discrimination was exposed, and it blew the university wide open, and subsequently um, there was, from what I understand, a much more acceptable uh, pattern of, 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 it, of admitting uh, Jews and other non-British ethnics into you know, the choice professional schools like medicine in Manitoba. Uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, there always was thought to be a quota, but not quite as stiff as the one at McGill, except that the data that has been collected and, and analyzed by Marty Friedland, who wrote a history of the University of Toronto, uh, suggests that um, that the the discrimination was not all that uh, severe, um, but the folklore had it that a Jewish boy girls didn't go into medicine in those days a Jewish boy in the 1940s and 50s had to have uh, substantially if he came from Toronto had to have a substantially higher uh, grade point average uh, than uh, the Smiths and the Joneses um, entering the University of Toronto. And that was the folklore, as I say. I don't know if anybody ever really documented it, but the official data from the medical school suggests that it wasn't as severe as all that. Now, in other parts of the country, I don't know, uh, but McGill stands out, not only in the Faculty of Medicine, but the Faculty of Dentistry. I don't know about law so much, um, but even in the arts and sciences, uh, I went to McGill, I did a master's degree there in, uh, from 58 to 60. Um, it was, uh, it, it, the quotas were still in effect, allegedly. I never ran into them, but um, just, uh, I'm not sure why, maybe my good looks, I'm not sure, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, it, it, uh, it, was, it was there, it was alleged to be there.
Jonathan Bader confirms that Porta, Pat, McGill, and Toronto, and I have seen some of the documentation of Toronto. You have, eh? Yes. But uh, we're Queens is another story, as we know. Mm -hmm. Well, Queens is another story, yes. Um, yes? Uh, just getting away from hockey players, uh, have you got uh, examples of uh, Canadians that are in the league with Seinfeld? <laughs> uh, there were some Canadian Jewish boys. Uh, was there some guy from Winnipeg? Uh, Steinberg. Steinberg, yeah. Uh, didn't he make it big down, down there? Wayne and Schuster were pretty big. Wayne and Schuster, were, they were big up here. I don't know about... The, big in the States, too? Okay. Um, uh, Howie Mandel, is he, is he Canadian? He's from Toronto. Okay. So there you go. Um, I mean, I haven't tracked it, but just... paper in it for someone. Sam? I was just going to add the story out of McGill was not so much only the quota, but the fact that the university not want to deal with the people in the question and actually appointed a subcommittee of well-known Jewish members of the community and told them to choose the number that they wanted and even go through the regular admissions committee. Um, is, that, is that true now, are you no, saying? No, this was in the 50s and late in the early 60s, but the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, the quota was there Is that so? To choose them. Uh, the, the problem in Toronto was not so much the university uh, quotas, it was just that when people graduated from medical school, they often found it very difficult to get internships in the really Toronto hospitals. The, the university was quite liberal, but many of the hospitals were restricted. It was, it was exceptionally difficult uh, to get an internship at a Toronto hospital up until the early 1960s. Uh, outside of Mount Sinai. And a few were able to get into, I think, the Toronto Western. That was the folklore anyway. But the rest of the Toronto hospitals, no Jews. So I have a question, and maybe I'm skirting on thin grass, you know, like the nice here, but would you, you mention that there are Jews in the in the mother, in the medical school, you mean? Well, I mean, to Queens, my 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 uh, Laurie's uncle was a graduate of Queens Med's twenty nine, but we know what he's asked. You know, if there was a quota. Yeah, there's a quota. Well, uh, that could have been the case, and yet, you know, look what happened to Alfred Bader. I mean, this is the one university that would admit him. Uh, um, the other thing is that in 1942, there was a row here. Uh, Gordon, you know all about this. A terrific row, which went all the way up to the Board of Trustees because it was alleged there were too many Jews at Queens. Um, and um, one of the members of the Board of Trustees, I think his name was Collins, uh, did some peculiar math and uh, figured out that uh, um, there, were, there were so many Jews here uh, at that time that it was a serious threat to the Christian integrity of uh, university uh, and the integrity on other, other grounds as well. So, um, um, wait, so what, the gentleman at the back, and then I'll take the cue, and then I think that's enough. Yes. Yeah, Jerry, uh, you just sort of briefly mentioned Jews in the left, and the, uh, I was just wondering if you maybe comment a bit further on what you see as the differences, because it, I think I think often the, the, the differences get exaggerated because a lot of Canadians think about the Cold War, they think about the United States, they think about the execution of the Rosenbergs, and so many Canadians don't. Fred Rose wasn't executed, but he was he was exiled. Uh, Professor Halpern of Queen's University was caught up in the in the Cold War. Um, and so I think, I think there's an argument that the Canadian left Jewish experience on the left was 
more like the American experience than, than many of us like the you know, yeah. We think about the peaceable kingdom, but can yeah. you just sort of speak to what you see as the, as the distinctiveness of the, of the Canadian... Of the Canadian the Jewish, Jewish... Of the Jewish left. Of the left. Yes, and, and during the Cold War. Well, uh, I, I think, you know, there was, there was nothing like, to the best of my knowledge, there was nothing like the same degree of persecution of people on the left um, in the Canadian media, in the Canadian universities, as few Jews as there were in the universities, uh, teaching in the universities in those days. I don't think very much of, a, of, a, of an issue was made about it, but this, there's a man by the name of Cher uh, who, uh, who has tried to document what happened to uh, leftist radicals, not just Jewish, but lots of, lots of others as well. Um, and his argument is, uh, from what I understand, that there, you know, there was discrimination, persecution, there was some firing from the points, but it was never as dramatic and as far-reaching as it went in the United States. You know, there, um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, reaction to um, the, the reaction uh, on the part of the of the right to the left during the Cold War was was far more extreme. Not just in the execution of the Rosenbergs, that was the most dramatic part. And that I think was that's an issue that that somebody's got to write a, a book about. Um, I, mean, the, I don't mean the Rosenberg case, but the the way in which it impacted on the on the American Jewish community, I think uh, deserves a book. But um, uh, the the Maudis did their work uh, for sure. They were just as searching as the FBI was in the United States. Um, I've seen some of the files, and boy, I haven't seen the file on on Joe Salzberg, uh, but uh, they were very assiduous in watching everybody and. Uh, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you're right. Professor Halpern uh, was um, was named here uh, at Queens, uh, but he he was not fired, and there was a hell of a row about it because some members of the board of trustees at Queens wanted him fired, and others named. Uh, uh, who were involved, but especially Professor Halpern and the principal of the time, I think it was, was it Wallace? Um, Wallace stood his ground. And so did Chancellor Dunn. Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, maybe the peaceable kingdom <laughs> does, does work. <laughs> uh, but yeah. There's more to be said on yeah. that. But. A Jew couldn't get a job in those factories during the war. Yes, right. There was there was discrimination in, in employment that, that affected the working class. Yeah. Very interesting. One more question? Anybody else? Yes, yeah, one, one more and then, and please go ahead. Just maybe a bit off the mark because I know 
Well, I, you know, obviously I have an eye on Quebec. Uh, and we all should have an eye on Quebec because, you know, there's nearly, there nearly 100,000 Jews living there. And uh, the, um, it, it's, it's a very interesting social picture now uh, because a significant segment, probably about 30%, um, are of uh, Sephardic origin and French speaking. Um, and what they, what the nature of, of French Canadian nationalism will be in the future, uh, I don't know, but there are, are a lot of people, uh, including the Frank, French speaking Jews, who are on tender hooks. That's, that's one thing I, I, I'm watching and uh, worrying about. The other thing that I think uh, uh, is worth looking at is the uh, is the pattern of assimilation, the pattern of uh, of intermarriage, uh, the the nature of uh, Jewish identity in North America, both in Canada and the United States and elsewhere in the world, um, is is rapidly changing. The other thing I would pay attention to uh, is, despite the fact that there is a strong tradition of Zionism in the Canadian Jewish community. Um, I think in the younger generation that is, that is waning significantly. Um, uh, and there is um, not nearly the same degree of identification with, of Jewish, uh, of young Jews, that is to say college age, young university age Jews, um, to um, this form of Jewish identity. There may be other forms developing, but I think the Zionist element um, uh, is in, in transition. So those are a couple or three things that I would watch, both in Canada and the United States. And there's, you know, the sociologists are, are tracking this thing and the, the good ones are worth paying attention to. Thank you, Jared. And uh, thank you. And just, just before we, we, we let you all go, I would like to ask Dr. Gordon Dewitt to thank our guest speaker tonight on behalf of us all. Yeah, just very briefly, um, in the 90s, uh, at, when I first got here, I expressed an interest in, the, in Jewish history, and Klaus Hansen told me to go talk to Jerry Tolchinsky, and Jerry said, this is not the place um, to study Jewish history. Um, well, interestingly enough, though, within a few years, it did become a place to study Jewish history, um, largely through his efforts. Um, his books made him the dean of Canadian Jewish history. Um, the Jewish studies program got off uh, and running and he became one of its heads. And um, I also think it's entirely appropriate that um, this year is the year that, we, that, that the archives should invite him and uh, because it's the, it's the centenary of Beth Israel congregation. And those of us who are interested in local Jewish history, um, I think owe him a debt because his books uh, allow us to contextualize our, our local experience. Um, and I know for a fact that uh, when I went on my, uh, historical, my Jewish historical walking tour a couple of weeks ago, I know that I, I relied on Canada's Jews quite heavily, especially the section on, on peddlers because of his knowledge of business and how it connects with the economy. Uh, how peddlers connect with a larger economy, I was able to contextualize the experience of local families like the Abramskis and, um, and, and many others who started off as other scrap dealers and, and peddlers. The, the Rosens are still in the scrap dealer business. And uh, it is astonishing. Uh, I think it was because of him I got interested in, in this area of business and I found out that until, up until the 1990s, 90% 90 of scrap dealerships in America were owned by family Jewish family, uh, Jewish families. Um, and so th these patterns that I otherwise would not have really paid much attention to, or would not have really understood, maybe only understood as local phenomena, I was able to pursue because of his books and his expertise. And I think we should all thank him for giving a talk today. But for those of us who are interested in, in Kingston, Canadian, and Jewish history, I think we should all show him our appreciation. And uh, again, just before I let you go, I do want to acknowledge um, three other people, if I could. The first is Vivian Ludwin and her.
archives committee from Beth Israel that spent hours and hours and hours and hours, as Jerry said, going through the records in our archives. Not only did they boost our, our, our numbers coming through the door, thank you all very much. Um, it was great to get to know um, some of you um, mu much more, and also to thank you very much indeed for the two uh, DVD set of your interactive um, commemorative display that you, you had up. You folks did an absolutely fascinating job, and it's, it's something that I know we in the archives will be using as examples of how others can use archives in terms of the, the material that we have and what, what it can be turned into. So thank you very much, Vivian, and, and your, your committee. And I'd be remiss indeed if I didn't think, think thank two of my staff, um, Susan Office and Heather Holm, for working behind the scenes to make this possible tonight. I'm, I'm the front man, but uh, all the work really goes on behind. And finally, to thank all of you for coming out this evening and making this such a success as it is. And please, um, in order to trade stories and perhaps Jewish hockey cards, if you'd like to join us for refreshments out in the lobby, appreciate that very much. Thank you all.